Israeli munitions that human rights groups say is white phosphorus. A deadly weapon illegal to use against civilians now it appears landing on the people of Gaza. These pictures show what is believed to be white phosphorus in the heart of Gaza's neighborhoods. We saw a bright flash of light in the evening and then saw all these sparks fall near us. The sparks were landing all around us and in our homes. Our mattresses caught on fire. On the ground in Jabalia, home to more than 100,000 Palestinians, children unaware of the deadly toxin dropped on them, naively playing with the munitions. As adults look on describing the poisonous effects it has had on them. It's the first time we see this type of weapon. It must be new and it seems like phosphorus. It's suffocating and has a deadly poisonous smell that I'm sure will cause a lot of sickness and disease on all the civilians here. While the weapon white phosphorus is not illegal to manufacture or use in warfare, its use against civilian populations is a violation of international law and a possible war crime. And in Israel's war on the densely populated Gaza Strip, it's the civilian population that once again seems to be affected by these munitions that are extremely flammable and can cause life-threatening burns when coming in contact with human skin. The Israeli military says the weapons it's using against Gaza comply with international law. But while the claim and counterclaim goes on, one thing is clear. The civilian population is suffering, and that suffering shows no sign of abating. Ayman Mohidin al Jazeera, Gaza. And we'll be speaking to Ayman a little later on the program. He'll be at a hospital where doctors say they're treating burns that look like they've been caused by white phosphorus. So, is the Israeli military using the chemical? My colleague, David Foster, put that question to Mark Gregor, the Israeli Prime Minister's spokesperson. This is what he had to say. Yeah, I can tell you straight out, the Israeli army use, uses no weaponry that is uh, outlawed under international convention. The Israeli army uses no weaponry that's not used by NATO forces, by the forces of Britain, Canada, the United States, and other countries. Okay, if we're talking about nuances, yes Mr. No. Reagan, um, yeah, let's be specific that. here, rather than sort of tiptoeing around it, which is what you seem to be doing by saying you don't use stuff that's outlawed. Are you using white phosphorus? You met my colleague, Major Avital Leibovich, a number of times in this chair. You should ask her. I'm not aware of operational procedures. That's not my job. I'm not the IDF spokesperson. I do know that it would be unfair to point the finger at Israel for using a munition that is used by Canadians, Frenchmen, Germans, if it's accepted munitions in NATO. Well, if, if Canadian, French, or whoever else were sitting in the yeah, same chair as you are representing the government of Israel, I, I would ask their representatives exactly the same. Are you saying you don't use it, or are you saying you don't know? Once again, I don't have, I, I'm saying quite out, I don't have the knowledge of that detail of what munitions we're using. I can only know for a fact that Israel uses no munition whatsoever that is outlawed under international convention that NATO forces wouldn't use in a similar combat situation. And I'll be putting those questions in turn to the Israeli military spokeswoman, Major Vital Leibovich, on the Al Jazeera News Hour at 1800 GMT, so make sure you catch that. Well, joining me now from Jerusalem is Senior Military Analyst with Human Rights Watch, Mark Garlasco. Thanks so much for joining us. Let me start by asking you, why are some suggesting Israel is using white phosphorus? How strong is the evidence that you've seen? I don't really understand what the controversy is. I've stood on the border of Gaza watching Jabalia as it's been hammered by white phosphorus over the past few days. It's very clear as you walk by the uh, Israeli 155 millimeter artillery batteries, they're handling American manufactured white phosphorus rounds. They're fused. You don't fuse it unless you're going to use it. And I'm watching as the white phosphorus explodes in air in an airburst situation and comes down and covers the area of the refugee camp. It's not an illegal weapon, so why is Israel not saying that uh, they're using it? I don't really get it. The problem, of course, is that while it's not illegal to use to cause smoke and create a smoke screen, it is illegal to use if you're going to harm a civilian population. And that's what the problem is that we have and why we're calling on Israel to stop using white phosphorus in densely populated areas. It's one thing if they want to use it in the open areas, but not to use it where people are living. I imagine Israeli officials will probably argue that they're not using it to target civilians, that they're using it to cover their troop movements. Is that a defense? 
Well, clearly they may see that as a defense, but I see that as semantics. The problem is the incidental incendiary effects against the civilian population are going to happen no matter the reason or the stated reason that you're using uh, a weapon. And so when the white phosphorus comes down, it does not distinguish between a military object and a civilian object. It lands anywhere. It will land and go through people's people's windows, it'll land on skin, it'll burn houses. And so this is why it's very important that this type of thing is not used in the densely populated area. We believe at Human Rights Watch that Israel is not taking all feasible precautions to spare the civilian population of harm when they're using this weapon, and that's why they must stop. So you can clarify a, a point for us. The 1980 uh, Geneva Convention on the use of those sorts of chemical weapons, uh, talks about its use in civilian areas. Well, would it be correct to say that even if you're targeting military personnel in civilian areas, in, in densely populated civilian areas, and you know that there's a very high chance civilians are going to be impacted by that, and therefore that is in uh, contravention to that agreement? Well, first we have to understand white phosphorus is not a chemical weapon. It's not one of the chemicals that is under the Chemical Weapon Convention. It's not treated as such. Regardless of it not being a chemical weapon, I agree with you wholeheartedly that if you are using it, even targeting uh, uh, some kind of a military target in a civilian area, because it cannot distinguish between civilians and military, it should not be used because then it would be an illegal use. Is it enough to drop leaflets and tell people, get out of town or get out of areas where there's fighting? Well, we are very happy to see that the Israelis are putting out warnings. The problem is these are not effective warnings. Uh, first of all, they're very vague. They don't really tell Palestinians much. But more importantly, where are they supposed to go? The Egyptians are not allowing people to cross, which is outrageous. And the Israelis are not allowing the Palestinians to have safe havens at all. And so it's really quite stunning, even though these uh, leaflets are being dropped, even though phone calls are being made, what are people to do? And so we at Human Rights Watch are calling on the Israelis and the Egyptians, open the borders, allow safe passage. Mark, we're hearing allegations Israel is, is using white phosphorus. We've heard this before from other uh, you know, allegations, other powers in wars using white phosphorus, uh, whether intentionally or unintentionally, but harming civilian populations. What recourse do civilians have? Who can take any legal action over this? Well, really, that's what we need right now is, as far as investigations, and that's something that we're looking for. And we've been calling on Israel to allow in the press, to allow in Human Rights Watch and other humanitarian organizations, and to allow in the United Nations so that there can be a thorough investigation of what's actually going on, how this war is being fought, both by Hamas and by the Israeli Defense Forces, so that then any investigation can be taken forward to a, some type of an international court so that we can see what's going to happen uh, as far as repercussions. Uh, but it's most important, before we even talk about what kind of legal action can be taken, that we establish the facts. That before we, we look at rumor and substantiate uh, or, or discuss rumors, that we get down to the real, real facts. And only by having thorough investigations and allowing us in is that ever going to take place. All right, thanks for your comments, sir. Mark Alasco from Human Rights Watch. Well, as this war enters its third week, the human toll is rising for the people caught in the war zone, the civilians. Nearly 900 people are dead. 40% are estimated to be women and children. Imran Khan has more on that. At Gaza's main hospital, Al Shifa, another tale of the pain of war. This boy was caught in an Israeli raid. Well, uh... We were told that the Israeli troops had gone back, so we went home. We took our food, drink, and clothes. My brother called my father and he left the house, so we waited for him. When he came back, we were hit. Some people came and pulled us out and wrapped us in blankets. We gathered near our mosque and they brought us to the hospital. And as the violence still continues, it's been reported that the Red Cross will no longer accompany ambulances on their missions in Gaza. It's yet another blow to Gaza's medics, already working under terrible conditions. But, despite power failures, critically low medical supplies, and a mounting death toll, the work still goes on. As another victim of the war tells us, I was playing on the roof with my cousins and brothers. All of a sudden, we were hit by a missile, and I fainted. I believe that I lost everything. Despite that, I will try to overcome the situation and my losses. 
It was a day that was supposed to have had a three-hour halt to the violence, a humanitarian corridor as it's been called, but barely halfway through the three hours, explosions could be seen in the Gaza Strip. Some vital aid did make it through. According to many aid agencies, though, it's not nearly enough. Even the drivers seem to be frustrated. In the current time, I have milk for babies, mattresses, bed covers, and flour for the poor people inside that are continuously bombarded. This is all I can help with under the bombardment. For now, Israel continues its pounding of the Gaza Strip, and the residents continue to hope that it will come to an end soon. Imran Khan, Al Jazeera. Well, to get more information on that humanitarian situation in Gaza, just how dangerous it is for medics uh, to operate there, particularly first off from the Red Cross. Joining me now on the line from Jerusalem is Anne-Sophie Bonefeld.